Who is God? What has He done for me? What does He want me to do for Him in return? Answers to life's great questions that really work through video Bible study. Welcome to Video Bible Study. I'm Les Miller. Today we're going to have a sort of catch-all topic under the umbrella title Christian Standards. Actually quite a number of different issues that will be discussed. And as the study progresses I'm sure you'll see the common themes that are involved in the individual things we talk about. Let's of course have our opening prayer. And thank you for being with us today. May the Lord bless you. Dear Lord, this is a wonderful topic to study out and think about. And as we branch off in several different directions in our study today, I pray your spirit will be with each person who watches our video and that they'll follow along on the different limbs of the uh, tree that we're creating here, tree of thought. And I pray your spirit will be with us to see in the end the overall common theme involved and how it relates to a true spiritual experience with you and how it can help us get to know you better. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing your Son to die on the cross for us, to give us the ability to live right every day. In His name we pray. Amen. Now you may remember from the forgiveness video, we talked about sin and the need to repent of sin. Now there's a lot of common ideas people have in various churches, various understandings of spiritual things, as to what constitutes sin and repenting of sin. For example, most Christians, they won't smoke, they won't drink, they won't gamble, and they understand that uh, our sex-crazed society with the adultery that goes on is wrong. And of course, these are all right and true understandings in and of themselves. We are not going to definitely contradict anything like that. What we're going to do is take it to the next level and give you an even deeper understanding of what it is the Bible says that you need to understand in order to experience God more fully. I think sometimes about some of the other topics um, we could discuss. Abortion, homosexuality. If you've even read the Bible at all, you know, you, you should know that things like that are wrong. We shouldn't need a major video uh, effort, a study effort on something like that. So those are the kinds of things we've already briefly covered, as I said, in the forgiveness video, the idea of repenting of sin and what most people think of as sin. So today we're just going to go a little further. But I want to start off actually with your homework assignment. I'd like to ask you to read Exodus chapter 20. That's the Ten Commandments when they were first given by the Lord on Mount Sinai to Moses and the Israelites. And, of course, the law is still applicable for us today, as we've learned. I'd like to ask you to ask God to show you if there's any part of your life that needs to grow and change in order that you may understand truth and spirituality and Him better. And, as well, cross-reference your study of the Ten Commandments, please, with Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 basically provide shall we say, a practical application of the Ten Commandments into everyday life. It's about above and beyond living. It's about an experience in doing right and being good, and it's more than just a set of rules. And so you really need to take the two of them together in order to understand more fully. What we're going to do today, discuss some do's and don'ts, and spend more time on some things that basically have been left to the fringes of most people's spiritual experience. A lot of people don't think they're important anymore, but in actuality they are, and they do need to be covered at some point. So our second last video in the series is the right and appropriate place to cover them. Let's go to our first Bible verse, Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, part of our four in a row rapid succession of Bible verses. And there the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, 
exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Next verse in our rapid fire succession will be Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. In Micah 6 8, the Bible says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Next verse, Titus chapter 2. We're going to go to Titus chapter 2. We will start at verse 12. We will read until verse 14. The Bible says, Teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous of good works. Final verse in our rapid-fire succession will be Isaiah 41, 9. But I like the way the King James says it a little bit better than the New King James. So I'm going to go back to King James English here. For Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 9. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Do you see the overall point made by those Bible verses? When your heart is in this world, when your mind is on the things of this world, your life is all about self-glorification. You may be expressing that need in different ways. Some people try to glorify themselves through power, some people through knowledge, and some people, as we'll see in a minute, through beauty. There are many ways people could try to glorify themselves, but living to know God living to do the right thing and stand up for the truth in this world. That is what life is all about. I like the way Isaiah has put it there in our King James reference. You're called out from the chief men. You see, if you're doing things fairly well in this life, if you're honest, if you're hardworking, if you're living at least in that basic level of Christianity that God wants you to live at, then most of the times, most people do have pretty good lives. But living just to get those benefits just to get the big house, just to get the nice car, and saying, you know, the idea all true Christians drive Cadillacs, that's not what God wants. He calls you out from that. He calls you to a higher purpose. You are to be a living example that His way really works. And you are to share the truth with as many people as possible and help people in practical ways and do justly and love mercy and be humble. These are the kinds of things God wants you to do. These are the kind of things I've said many times in these video series. I'll say it again probably a few times here. The idea I like to get across is becoming the person God wants you to be. And these verses provide an excellent description of just what that really is all about. But let's get on to some details as to what we're talking about when we say take it to the next level. Let's talk about gambling, for instance. Think about the fact that no true Christian would ever be caught dead in a casino in Las Vegas playing blackjack or roulette or any of those kind of things. Christians do not go into the bars and pump money into video lottery terminals and throw them away. But think about it. What about buying lottery tickets? That's still gambling. What about playing the stock market? What about sinking all this money into mutual funds and investments and things like that? They're all still forms of gambling, you see. You look in the Sermon on the Mount, you compare it to the Ten Commandments, and you see how sin starts in the heart. It all starts with that selfishness within you. I remember when I was a kid, my dad taught me how to play poker. And I had the same level of selfishness in my heart and in my mind when I was betting $2.00 versus when I was betting $25. It didn't matter. The issue was the selfishness within. And when people put their hearts in this world with their finances and focus on, you know, having a grand and glorious retirement and saving all this money up for their retirement, they're basically doing the same thing. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, it's Matthew 6, 19 to 21, he wants us 
to have our hearts in the next world, get ready for heaven. And one of the ways we can do that with is, of course, with money. We're going to look that verse up. I'll just turn to it here. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, one of the ways people glorify themselves in self-glorification is with money. What's one of the practical solutions God has to help you not fall into that trap? We have several different examples in the Bible. We'll read one verse, and if you'd like to learn more, tithe. T-I-T-H-E. One-tenth of your income, give it to God. Let's look at what Jacob did just after he received the dream of the ladder when he was going off on his far journey away from his home. This is one of the last things he said in his prayer as he was leaving. It's Genesis 28, 22, and there the Bible says, And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. It's something interesting if you've never noticed it. It's something I noticed a few years ago in pondering human nature and the way people's minds work. You see, whatever you consider to be your basic needs, that's going to take up between 70 and 90% of your income. And the rest of the money you have is going to be what people like to call their mad money. That's the money you usually throw away on selfish indulgences. That's the money you usually can never figure out where it goes because you just sort of waste it. That's the money God says, take it, give it to me. Spend it on something better. Spend it on advancing my truth in the world. Most of the tithe money in most churches goes to pay the minister's salary. And you know what? That's right and that's true and that's fair. Ministers should be paid by the people who come to church. Nothing wrong with that. And the rest of the money in the free will offerings goes to pay for church buildings. It goes to pay for missionary work. It goes to pay for helping the poor and other charitable things. God wants you to make room for others. And he wants you to make room for him in the way you spend your money and not just be selfish with your money. He knows you've got to pay your bills. He knows just like he gave you the fourth commandment. Six days a week you do your work. One day, the Sabbath is the special day. It's a seven day a week commandment. He knows you need most of your money to pay your bills. But he says, take the rest, spend it on me. You see, and it's a wonderful thing. It's a spiritual experience. Just as the ancient Israelites brought their offerings, their physical offerings were goats and sheep and things like that. That's been replaced with us in a way when we bring money. And putting the money in the offering plate in church is a spiritual thing. It is just as much a part of worship as is saying the prayer, singing the hymns, and hearing the sermon. Just as important. An even more spiritual way to understand this issue is to use the example of when parents buy their children gifts. The parent calls them your toys, but the child didn't purchase those toys, the parent did. God created everything, and he is the one who gave you everything you own. You are therefore not paying tithes and offerings, you are returning them. This concept is referred to as stewardship. I was in conversation once with my wife on the issue of money and self-glorification. She brought up an interesting point about jewelry and how expensive jewelry is and basically shared with me her thoughts, how people, when they wear a lot of fancy jewelry, are basically wearing their money, which really struck me because it's a real practical way people do attempt to glorify themselves. In fact, we'll go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll see an interesting reference here that I think would solve a lot of problems in this world if people really understood the full realities of it. 1 Peter chapter 3, we will read from verses 3 to verse 5. Do not let your beauty be that outward adorning or arranging the hair of wearing gold or of putting on fine apparel, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. 
For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. It's interesting. As I mentioned from the verse in Jeremiah that we looked up, a lot of people, especially men, they do like to attempt to glorify themselves based on their might and their power. And some women do this as well. But there's one way in which women have power in this world that men don't, and that is, of course, through their beauty. Women are given beauty in a way that men aren't. And this issue of being focused on looks is something that affects women more than men normally. So I have another special homework assignment I'd like to ask the ladies to look up. Isaiah chapter 3. And I want you to notice how in Isaiah chapter 3 there is so much of what we have today in the way of jewelry that is condemned there. That is definitely, obviously, from a reading of the chapter, tied to this basic principle of self-glorification. Again, God wants people to make a higher commitment. There are some Bible examples of people wearing jewelry, but there are also examples in the Word as well of people who, when they understood more fully the truth and what they were to do for God, and God called them to a higher level of experience in Him, one of the ways in which they showed their desire to participate in this was that they gave up their jewelry and stopped uh, wearing their jewelry. Another reason why it's not right for Christians to wear jewelry is from 1 Timothy chapter 6, and it's verse uh, 16. This is talking about God the Father. It says about God the Father, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. When you think about that, God dwells in a light that no man can approach unto. So when a person takes a shiny piece of metal with a shiny stone, puts it in a strategic part of their body, they're basically trying to do something that reflects light, aren't they? And the more they wear, the more light they reflect. And therefore, they're essentially trying to create a light for themselves to dwell in. Do you see how that ties to self-glorification? Do you see how, with a humble, simple understanding, you can live much better and be at more peace? Because you're not trying to fight that un unwinnable battle trying to make yourself better than everybody else. You can just be who you can be and be the best you that you can be through God. And you can have peace of mind in the end of the day. You see, it's much better. It's much better that way. Something else to think about? Uh, tattoos. God made you with this inner beauty and you put a tattoo on your body. You know, it's not going to be something that's going to enhance that beauty. It's a defilement. It's a mark that is a scar. A lot of people, when they're young, they think they're so hot, they think they're so cool, and they go and get the fancy tattoo to try and show the world, this is how cool I am. And then later in life, they come to see the error of their ways, and they come to wish, and they say, you know, if I had it to do over again, I probably wouldn't do it. So that's something to think about as well. On a more practical side, covering these issues, what would it do if everybody would believe this? What would it do to the issues we have today with young girls and self-esteem? How the young girl sees the model on the magazine cover and all of a sudden she says in her heart, I don't measure up. I'm not as good as that girl because I'm not as beautiful. And of course that girl is airbrushed and made up and has got all this perfect lighting and everything and there's so many changes by the time you get from the real face to the magazine cover. It's not even a real person anymore. It's basically a picture of a doll. When you compare yourself to others like that, you're always going to come up short. But when you see the value of inner beauty and of a humble, simple life living God's way, then all of a sudden you can have peace of mind, as I've been saying. We're going to go now to Acts chapter 17. And verse 30. I don't want anybody to think that if they have a tattoo or if they have a whole bunch of uh, stud holes in their body from all this jewelry they've been wearing, 
that that somehow means that they're not welcome at church. Let's go to Acts chapter 17, verse 30, and see what Paul said to some people that he was trying to win, trying to reach out to and tell them about the true God. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. If someone had a level of spirituality where they saw that God was working in their lives and they didn't know that it was wrong to wear jewelry, they didn't know it was wrong to have a tattoo, and these are things they participated in and did, well, it's not that somehow God's trying to drive you away. It's God wants to bring you to a higher understanding, a better understanding. So you're not going to get another one, are you? But just come to Him as you are. He'll make you the person He wants you to be. And in the end, in the resurrection, when he brings people up out of the grave with new bodies to live with him forever in heaven, those tattoos will be gone. Those scars from the piercings they've put in their body all be gone as well. The only scars that will be left will be the scars in the hands and the feet and the side and the head of Jesus who died on the cross for us. And we'll look at him and we'll always remember it's because of what he did that we were able to be saved and live with him forever.